Well, it's another privilege to be here to study God's word. And throughout the quarter, throughout the quarter, we have been looking at rest. But, you know, I think it is, it is necessary that we reflect on what we've learned. So for the first five minutes, two of us will reflect on what we've learned during the quarter as we considered rest in Christ. This was a quarterly theme, rest in Christ. So I will start, and then Glendale will do five, and I will do the next five, okay? It won't stay long, five minutes. When we started, we're looking at rest in Christ, which was the theme of the lesson. And you know, throughout the quarter, all I was seeing was restlessness. Restlessness in all forms. But I thank God for those people who wrote the lesson because it really took us and lead us on. So the first lesson we started is where we all are in this world of confusion and restlessness and turmoil. What was the answer? And it continued. That theme continued in lesson two, restlessness and rebelliousness. And it showed here that people around you sometimes can make you very restless, as we saw with Miriam and Aaron, Moses' brother. But lesson three went to the root of rebelliousness, the root of restlessness, which was, of course, rebellion. Have mercy. And as I reflect, I thought, no, these people were really inspired by God. Because every week we can see ourselves where we are. But of all the lessons, this one really touched me. Because it spoke about selfishness. It spoke about jealousy, our selfish ambitions, the gossiping, the backbiting, restlessness. And therefore, these are the things that really cause havoc. Well, you know, lesson four, lesson four given us a solution, the cause of restlessness, which was the showed us David and how David changed when he realized that his only source of restlessness was in Christ Jesus. Amen. And continuing on lesson five, it tells us who or rather where we will get our rest from. Um, it tells us to come unto me and... Um, Talking about God's yoke, being um, his yoke is easy and his burden light. And we praise God that, um, that we can go to God, go to Christ for, for the ultimate rest. Then finding, lesson six, finding rest in family ties. I love that one. We're talking about Joseph and his brothers. And, you know, a lot of us, if we were in Joseph's position and we were, you know, um, in lesson uh, six, we, we talked about all the things that they did to him. And we thought about all of those things. Boy, I wonder if how many of us would be as forgiving as Joseph was. But Joseph found true rest because he was able to forgive his brother brothers and then lesson seven tells us about rest and relationships and he continued talking about joseph and his brothers and the relationship that they had with each other and after forgiveness the, the way that they were able to bond together and just reminded us that you know as when we have our, our families we may have issues we may have difficulties but you know what there is rest in effective close family ties. And even if you don't have um, external family, we praise God for our church family where we can find rest with our church family. And then lesson eight. And you know what, what, uh, what excited me about lesson eight? We talk about Elijah. And what it told me was that someone as powerful mm -hmm. as Elijah, mm -hmm. someone who could call uh, fire from heaven mm -hmm. as Elijah, someone who was able to say to them, you know, or maybe you're God sleeping, you mm -hmm. know, you know, cry out a little, a little, a little bit harder. Someone like Elijah was still restless mm -hmm. and couldn't find rest and still had to pray out to God because he was feeling so depressed, etc. But you know what? Even when Elijah um, kind of took his eye, if you like, off God, God still Amen. gave him rest. Amen. 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 And then we continued with the rhythm of rest. And here it pointed us right back to Jesus, who is the author of rest. Because it told us that God created us in the beginning and he redeemed us from the slavery of sin. Sabbath 10, lesson 10, what's the Sabbath rest? God has given a rest. And what I really focus on in, in that lesson 
they were telling us the Sabbath is not only for us, but we should be doing something for other people. So many of us, we sit in the church on Sabbath, we want to do missionary work. No, 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 Sabbath rest. And I thought, thank you, Jesus, for that explanation. Longing for more, we want more rest in this troubled world, in the church, in our communities, in our families. We need more rest. But right now, we find ourselves behaving like the children of Israel. Have mercy, God. And therefore, we go to serve t- uh, lesson 12. And last week, we look at that rebellious, restless prophet. Please. Because I think we all are like him. We all are like him. So, so just reflect on ourselves and where we are. Because this day, we need to be looking at the ultimate rest. What does that mean to us? So please, those of you at home, get your paper, your pens, your Bibles, and let's get down to some serious study as we look at the ultimate rest. Our quarter, our memory text is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. And it says, I has not seen, nor ever heard, those of you who have it, can you read it as well with me? Even you at home. Now have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. For those who love him. So therefore they're telling us immediately that if we want to experience that ultimate rest, we have to apply John 3, 16. God so loved the world that whosoever believeth in him, loved the love of Christ. But you know, in this time we are living in, Satan, from the beginning, that rascal, he was in heaven, Revelation told us. And because he was war in heaven, he was cast out into earth. And he went into the garden. And there he met our four parents, Adam and Eve. And since then, this world, we are just in rebellion. We are just not having that peace that God promised us. And not only the world, you know, in our lives, in our personal life, we can see that. But we have hope for you because this lesson, at the end of this lesson, you will realize that we all can have rest in Jesus Christ, who is our author. So the vision of the end. What happening here with John? What happening here with John? A vision at the end. Revelation 1.3 says, blessed are those who read. But tell us, Glendine, what's happening here? So uh, this is about uh, John um, being on the Isle of Patmos. But he was, and he says, you know, and I, John, I saw the holy city. I saw the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. So even though he was exiled and even though he technically didn't have any rest, even though it seemed like all was um, lost for John, um, Yet still, God was able to reach him in the prison and give him the revelation of the new Jerusalem and to give him that hope and that peace and that rest. And that is for us as well. When we are in certain situations, we think there is no hope. But today, I want you to know that there is hope. Brother Leslie. I think that um, the story began in the Garden of Eden. And John would have seen what happened to the world from that time. He was present when Jesus came to redeem the world. He was one of the disciples at the cross. So John had seen all of that. And God was saying to him, you have seen the travails from the time of the Garden of Eden up until where you are now. Now I'm going to give you a glimpse of what is yet to come. That what you have seen in the past is not the entire picture. I'm going to give you a picture of the future that is glorious and bright. Amen. That's what we're getting from John. Now, it's the first time you've heard our elder's voice. And this is Elder Leslie. And this is Glendine, Elder Glendine Shepherd. Just in case you're wondering, I know I did not introduce them. But I wanted you to hear this gentleman's voice. So that triggered me. So here we realize that as John was in the Isle of Pathmos, but... He had this vision. He and God told him what will not only happen then, but what will happen at the 
end of time. So it's the same God who helped the children of Israel. It's the same God who will help us. And as he took the children of Israel through the Red Sea, he is also willing to take us. But first we must rest in him. Ultimate victory in the garden came in Genesis when he said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. And therefore, Jesus Christ came. What an awesome God. Before we knew him, he decided he'd come and send his only son to die for us. But you know, as we look at the end of time, we have a countdown. When I hear a countdown, I think of only as night. Ten, nine, eight, seven. I wonder which number we are, if we do numbers. Uh, where are we on the scale of things? But you know, he told us, this lesson told us very plainly in Matthew 24, what is taking place. Yes. Um, God, well, Jesus, this is one of Jesus' sermons, I think, a few sermons that he would have preached. And um, he the the disciples is the ones who initiated this conversation in Matthew 24. They inquired of Jesus when, because Jesus pointed out about the temple being destroyed mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and so forth. And then they wanted to find out when would the time of the end be? What are some of the signs that will show that it is the time of the end. And Jesus gave them a number of different signs. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes when we, we think about these signs, we think these signs apply to our time only. But Jesus had given signs that was relevant to every age since he died. So people in John's time, when John was on the Isle of Patmos, could have looked at those signs of Jesus and applied to data. And I'm wondering, why would Jesus give us signs that can apply to every generation and to every time? Because I think Jesus was trying to send us a message that it is not about relaxing. Okay, I don't see these signs and therefore I can relax because it's not in my time. Jesus was trying to let people know that it is not only about the reward that they should focus on. It should be about how they relate to him daily. I should live daily for Christ regardless of whether I'm seeing signs or not. And that's absolutely it because, you, you know, we call it a countdown and the signs that uh, are there in Matthew, etc. However, we don't know when our end will come. That's right. So we don't know, you know, if today, I don't know if today is going to be my last day. I have no idea, okay? Which tells me that every day, every second, every hour, I need to, as the Bible says, to be dying to self, mm -hmm. to renew in my love for Christ, to uh, um, making sure that I'm asking for forgiveness and living my life in accordance with God's, God's will. Because if I'm uh, relaxing and thinking, well, I haven't seen the stars fall yet, or I haven't seen this happen, or I haven't seen that war, you know, we become complacent. And we have no time for complacency when we're, when we're in this life. Exactly. And therefore, we're supposed to be active participants. But you know, in Matthew 24, there are certain things that I would really like us to emphasize, and it's one word. Matthew 24, verse 4. And Jesus answered and said, Take heed that no one deceives you. Wow! In the beginning, remember in the beginning in the garden, he told, you shall not surely die. Deception. And it's the same thing he's doing to us now. We can live anyhow. Once we say we accept Jesus Christ, we can live anyhow. Mm -mm, no. This is where the countdown comes in because we ourselves need, as Leslie said, a daily surrender. And when we're talking about daily surrender, we're not talk, thinking of just giving some things to him and holding on to other things or trying to control things our way. No. Daily surrender is God's spirit abiding in us and giving us the power so that we can live above sin. So he said, do not be deceived. And throughout that 24th, 24th chapter, he's talking about deception. And as we continue, we will see rest in peace where this perception continues. So we are not to just sit idly. We have got a countdown. And the same way as we look to New Year's celebration and going to this, um, 
the river flames and looking at the fireworks, we too should be on fire Amen. to tell men and women that we can have rest in this restless world by abiding in Christ, accepting Jesus as your savior from sin. I, I think I want to follow up on that a little because <laughs> verse 13, uh, 14 is, is the Jesus gave a number of um, signs, mm -hmm. but then at the end of these signs, he says, but that's not yet the end. Mm -hmm. But the sign of the end is in verse 14. It is the only sign that Jesus points to what is going to be the end. And he said, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness unto the nations. And then, is the first time he said, Amen. shall the end come. Amen. So the, end, the sign of the end coming... <laughs> is a lot dependent upon you, me, and everybody here when the gospel reaches the active, ends of the world. Active right. participants. But yeah. I also think that it just shows the mercy of God. Amen. God's mercy in that he is ensuring that he's, his son will not come until everybody has an opportunity. Everybody hears his word and everybody... Um, has that opportunity to make that choice to live for him. Uh, to me, th that just shows God's mercy. So it is saying not everyone will accept him. No, not Not everyone will no, accept no, him. No. So as we but go out doing missionary and telling others of the love of Jesus, do not accept, expect everybody to say, yes, I'll accept him. Mm -mm. We just read a witness. So let us go apart. If we are tired here, let us do our part. Let us be active. And God in his mercy has given us gifts. He has already prepared us and given us things, gifts that we can use, skills that we can use to tell men and women of his soon coming. Do Leslie, you have a point? Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> okay, nice. okay, okay. So we have marching orders. Because we are not, act we should be active participants, we have got marching orders. What are you doing? What are you doing to hasten or to be a witness for Christ? Are you looking at other people or are you using the gifts, the talents, the abilities God has given us? Don't tell me they haven't asked me to do nothing in the church. God did not call you to work in the church. God wants you to go out there and witness his love. So please, we're not going down that road. All right. Brother Leslie, continue. Yes, I... I, I um under the marching order chapter um, um, day, um, they quarterly refer to the three angels' messages. And I was particularly thinking about the fourth angel's mm -hmm. message. And um, it says, Then I saw another angel flying directly above with an eternal gospel to proclaim to all who dwell in the earth. And he cried, fear God and give glory to him because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and, and so on. So this judgment is about God. Good news, think about it, what this thing is saying. He has this message to preach to everyone, a message of good news mm -hmm. because the hour of his judgment is come. And notice he didn't say the hour of your judgment is come. It is the hour of whose judgment? It is His the hour of judgment. God's judgment. And just bear with me a bit. As we go to, I want to go to, um, yes, I, I, I want to go just one text from, from Romans chapter 3 and verse 4. Romans chapter 3 and verse 4. God forbid, yea, let God be true. But every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy saying, that the mightiest overcome it when thou art judged. I think this judgment of Revelation chapter, the first angel's message, was a judgment of God that shows that God is true Amen. and every man is a liar. This judgment of Revelation chapter 14 is saying that God will be shown to be, to be true and that now we can worship this God who made all heaven and earth and so on and that it will prove that Satan is a liar. So the judgment of Revelation chapter 14 is about God being declared victorious, God being vindicated, and every other person is a liar, Satan. Amen. And you know, it's only as we share our testimonies that can be um, possible 
Because remember, these marching orders is one of commission going into all the world. But it seems as though some of us taking it as an omission. We're just sitting down doing nothing. What kind of marching orders do we have? But I also think, too, that we have this idea of three angels' message as Sunday Adventists. Real, real cliche, you know? Um, what's the next one they say? Gospel. Um, what it is? Present truth. Yeah. I talk to any Adventist. Oh, the three angels' message. Oh, present truth. But what does it mean to us? What does it mean to us? And therefore, in this lesson today, we want people to know we have been given marching orders. And as we do God's will, you will find that we have rest. But also, I mean, you know, some of us will think, um, you know, I'm I'm maybe not um, bold enough to go out on the street corners and, and, and proclaim. I might not be able to do this. God has given pastor's been talking about spiritual gifts god has given all of us a gift god has given all of us an ability and one of the things and god will never ask us to do something that we can't do yes if he's asked us to do it he will empower us and equip us to do it so even if you know we may not what's the song say you may not be able to preach that call or do whatever yeah you may not be able to stand on the street corner but there is some something somewhere there's someone somewhere that you need to witness to whether it's at work or at school or at play whether it's the way that you live just um this just uh, um i was at a conference um a couple of days this week and um one of the ladies at one of my fears was I'm going to be meeting all these people I have no idea, never met them before. And she, I was sitting next to this lady and she was talking. And I can't remember how I, I think I said something, about, I did something for church. And she said, oh, does your church play a really important part in your life then? And I'm thinking, God, even in a conference, you give me an opportunity. And I was able to say to her, yeah, she said, what, you know, what, what's your religion? I said, Seventh-day Adventist. I was able to explain mm-hmm, to her. Mm-hmm. And I thought, you know what? God gives you an opportunity, Mm -hmm. even when you least expect it, Mm -hmm. to be able to spread and tell someone of the everlasting gospel. And you know, it is a privilege, brethren. It is a privilege because he could have called angels. But no, he loves us so much. He wants us to engage with him daily so that our characters can be molded after his divine likeness. He is God and God alone. So let me ask you a question. What should be our response to these last day messages? One person. What should be our response to these last day messages? One person. Okay. Yes, Maureen. Thank you. Thank you. As well as that is only possible as we surrender ourselves daily to him. Just to say, if anyone has any comments they want to make, any questions or anything, please come up to the mic um, and and share your thoughts. We want this to be um, uh, total participation. So please remember, just come up to the mic. And Cheryl um, is looking at the... the, the, um, the comments on the chat, on YouTube, etc., and she'll share that. So if you're watching online and you want to participate in the lesson, please put your comments in the chat and we will read them out. So come on, let's, let's all participate. And, and for some of us, we might be thinking, oh, this world, so much pain, so much death, so much, especially now with COVID, eh? but brethren, God has got an answer because through it all, we can find rest, rest, in this time we are living in. You know, I was just going to ask that that question, and I think it's it's asked in in the next uh, section, rest in peace. When we we say that, rest in peace, what what does it mean? What what are we really saying? And I've seen a new one now, rest in eternal peace. Uh What what does that mean? When you say, when you're saying to someone, rest in peace, what are we saying? While she comes, not even, not even that. We go to the cemeteries and we say, rest in peace, rest in peace, rest in peace. Thanks for me. And is it biblical? Okay. For me, um, resting in peace is uh, when we look around and we see what is happening today. And we can bless for sure because of our faith, because of our belief in God, that Christ is coming soon. We don't have to fear. We just have to have faith and trust in him, knowing that one of these great, one of these days, you know, Christ will come and we spend seasons eternity with Him, where we never part again. 
So do we rest in peace when we're alive or when we die? Good question, because that's what we are being taught now. <laughs> I think Adventists, as Adventists, we love events. You know, there's an earthquake, we, we, we feed into that. And uh, any disasters, we love events, and we tend to focus on the events rather than on Christ and the gospel. So I believe that uh, in all the problems that we have in the world, and I think Glendine said that at the beginning, that, you know, we can have peace with God despite all the difficulties and the trials that we endure. We can have peace, have God in our lives. So despite we, we losing our loved ones, um, we have problems with Yesterday I queued for nearly an hour to get petrol. Things like that. All the different things that, in, in, that com makes our life complicated and brings problems in our lives. We, you know, we can still have peace with God. And, that is, and, and, and that's not the ultimate peace. The ultimate peace is when Christ comes. Um, yeah. <laughs> Ella Glendine, if uh, somebody told me to rest in peace, I'd be scared. Because you usually say, rest in peace, then you're dead. <laughs> so, but I think about Job, you know. Um, sometimes we look for this final rest to be a, a future event. But I think about Job, and Job said, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though my skin, after my skin, worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. Job was at rest, even though he was experiencing all of these difficulties. So when we see all of the trials and temptations and, and troubles that we are encountering, we should not become restless. I, I, I think, I think Elder Leslie is jumping because I think he's, I'm hearing saying, rejoice in it. So we, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. I know my dear. <laughs> <Yes, Diana. laughs> okay. Morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Do you know, regardless of what is happening in the world today, we have the Holy Spirit. Christ gave us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, when we are bonded with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit just brings things to our remembrance. Regardless of earthquake, hurricane, whatever is happening right now, we have the assurance that Jesus is with us wherever we go. So we have no need to be afraid or frightened because he is there with us all the time. So rest and be assured, Jesus is with us. Amen? Amen, amen. Personally, I think, um, and Elder Leslie, I know you, you kind of say, if someone said to you, rest in peace, you, you'd, you'd worry. But I actually think, as Adventists, we should be saying to each other, rest in peace while we're alive. Mm -hmm. Because it's about, when we're talking about the ultimate rest, and we know the re kind of rest that we're talking about. Because the lesson goes on to talk about, um, when we're talking about people rest in peace, and um, the notion that someone dies and goes straight to heaven. Mm -hmm. Yeah? And, and so when they're saying rest in peace, it's because they're, they're saying that the person is up in heaven and resting and with, with God and looking down. Personally, I think that notion sounds so cruel mm -hmm. in that if I, if I die and I go to heaven and I'm looking down and I can see my children uh, suffering or they're in pain or they need something or whatever, I'm not going to be resting in peace in heaven. There, there'll be no peace for me in heaven. It'd be, it'll actually be turmoil. Because I can't do anything about it. I'm, I'm up there, you know, supposedly flying around with, in wing, with wings and everything else, as this is what, you know, the, the, the notion is. Yeah. Uh, but, but you can't do anything about it. So I personally don't, don't think that that is resting in peace. Whilst you're on earth, I think that's when you can rest in peace because you're resting in Jesus. Let's hear, let's hear some comments. I'm, I'm coming back to that point. Yeah? It's, just, it's, just, it's just one comment on the uh, YouTube. But first of all, I, I do have to um, say, when... In life, would we be saying to someone to rest in peace? I really don't know. I'm Elder Leslie on that one. <laughs> okay. But um, there's an Amanda Wallace, and she says, rest in, RIP, rest in peace, is usually used in, uh, for death. Some of, my friends, sorry, some of my friends think that rest in peace is when someone goes automatically to heaven. And then she tells them about the state of the dead, and she backs it up with Bible verses. Okay. So, so, um, so we're going back to the same point in the beginning, Revelation 24. Do not be deceived. 
the same way he deceived Adam and Eve in the garden, it is continuing that people think that we can do anything and still have eternal life. We, we can do anything. When we die, we'll have a relationship. We go straight to heaven. No. When we die, John 11, 11 refers us to Lazarus. And Jesus said that he was a, asleep. So when our relatives die, they're not going to heaven. They're going into the grave. And as we continue, we will realize that when the trumpet shall sound, 1 Thessalonians 4, and the dead in Christ will rise. No, let's look, let's look, at, let's look at that text. It's very important. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We all repeat it all the time, all the time, all the time. 1 Corinthians, I'm coming. 4, 13. No, Thessalonians. Thessalonians 4.13. Third. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, those people who have died, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, the resurrection of Jesus, so vitally important, even so will God will bring with him those who are asleep. But the part I like is this verse. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not by any means precede. The trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ will rise first. So if your relative or anybody now, they are dead, please stop believing Satan's deception. Brother, Okay, okay. A quick one from YouTube. This lady, oh, that's Michelle. Michelle says, I think it's very different to say R.I. peace when referring to us being at rest on earth. I believe there is a clear distinction. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank, you. thank you. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Um, rest in peace applies to both the living and those who sleep in Christ. Christ is our peace. Mm -hmm. And while we are alive, he gives us counsel and instruction to follow so that we can have peace as we yoke up with him. When we sleep in Christ, we have the assurance that we will have our part in the first resurrection. So we sleep in peace. So whether we live or we die, we rest in peace. Okay. In the first Adam, all die. In the second Adam, all will be made alive through his redemption. Amen. So, okay. Yeah, rest in peace. Um, I was married over 50 years. My, we were married over 50 years, and um, my husband passed away. And when he passed away, you know, I, 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 I was in so much mourning because I missed him. But I've got a photograph. When he went to Jamaica and was leaving Jamaica, he waved. He waved, and every day I look at that photograph, and he waved. So I know he's waving to me. He's waving to me. He's just resting, and he's waving to me to tell me that he's going to see me again. So I, I'm, in, I'm in peace. I'm in peace because I know he's just sleeping. He's, he's sleeping, and... He's going to see me soon, and we'll see each other soon. So I'm at, at, I'm at peace because I know he is resting in peace. And you see, that's why I said, really, RIP is for, is for those who are alive because this is, you're saying you're at peace. Well, you know, your husband is sleeping, but you feel the peace um, knowing that you're going to see him again. So, you know, the, the peace that we feel comes from Christ, knowing that when our loved ones die in Christ and they're asleep, um, we can have peace because we know that we will see them again. Yes. No, no, no. We don't use the term R.I.P., but I'm saying... Good morning. Many of you may not know me, but I do come sometimes. I'm Sister Stevenson. Yeah. But my definition of rest in peace is basically when you bury it's just the flesh, the spirit that left, really left the body, so you just bury in the flesh, so the person probably even be at their own funeral watching us, probably laughing at us, saying whatsoever. So to me, rest in peace means really what you left behind, the burden, 
or the heavy load you had to carry or whatever going on in your life. So basically, at the end now, the spirit had left the body and you probably with God, Jesus, or whatsoever, but it's just the flesh that's actually in the grave. The spirit left the body long before you've been buried. Thank you. Just before Sister, Sister Ruth, thank you. Thank you. Thank Just you. Before Sister Ruth. Um, I think it's important to understand that, you know, when our loved ones, if, you know, if they were in pain before they died, if they, there were some who, who, who die um, after a long illness or whatever, then when they die, it's almost like a relief, a release. Yes, definitely. You know, they, they are now at peace because they're, they're sleeping peacefully. Peace. Yeah. So if death is if death is asleep, then you know sometimes when you you have a good night's rest, um, and you know you've been able to forget about everything, you dream nice dreams and everything else, and you wake up in the morning refreshed. Well, you know it's almost you, um, it's almost like they're having that that good night's rest. And when they wake up in the morning, and we're going to come on to it, when that morning comes, oh, <laughs> hallelujah, when that morning comes. Um, but they're at peace because they're, they're, they're not suffering anymore. There's no more pain. There's no more illness, etc. I, I, I will repeat to myself because, again, this is, this is a deception. This is the enemy's deception, and he continues to deceive us all the time. Ecclesiastes 5, no, 9, 5 says, For the living know that they shall die but the dead know not nothing when you die you go in the grave your body up but you do not know nothing so it's not granny auntie look at verse 10 who whatever your hand finds to do do it with all your mind for there is no work or device of knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going you don't know nothing until christ comes to that ultimate rest the dead in Christ shall rise. Somebody, come Ruth, come Ruth. Yes, while Sister Ruth is coming, mm -hmm. I just want to say that rest in, resting in peace is meaningless to the dead because the dead knows nothing. Amen. Resting in peace only have meaning for those of us who are alive. Amen, amen. I support that as well because once one is dead, they don't know nothing. They are sleeping and they are in peace because as Peter said, when they were alive, they were suffering, they were sick and going through all this pain. But once you have slept, you don't know nothing. Even if they keep on tossing you everywhere, you don't know nothing. If those who are alive, who know what they are doing to you? So in saying so, I will say, death is a sleep for which there will be awakening when Jesus comes the second time. And it's a combination of all our hopes for all who have died in Christ. Amen. And when Stephen was stoned to death, Luke wrote and said he fell asleep. The same as Daniel as well. The Old Testament said he is sleeping with their fathers. Amen. 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 So, okay. so with that point, I would like us to realize that without Christ's resurrection, we won't have any hope of eternal life. It is our central theme when we think of resting in Christ. Also, it is comforting. Amen. It's comforting to know that the dead in Christ will rise. But with all that, I heard the first bell, so we have another bell. Rejoice in the Lord always. All right. This is the last one. Rejoice in the Lord always. So why should we... In this, with all this turmoil and death and COVID and all this unemployment, how can we rest? How can we rejoice? You know, someone once said to me, happiness is a decision. And I used to think, huh? You decide to be happy. And just because you're saying that you're happy or you're rejoicing or whatever, it doesn't mean to say that there are no storms. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean to say that, you know, the turmoil isn't high or the bills are not high, etc. But it's about how, it's how you put it into perspective, how you put it into context and how you decide to deal with it. If you're dealing with it with Christ, if you, as he says, if you put, cast all your cares upon him, you can, as we sing, as we used to sing in, in kindergarten, you can smile at the storm. Amen. You can be happy in the storm because you know that ultimately, even if, yeah, and I always like that phrase, even if faith, you know, when the Hebrew boys, they went, when they went into the fire, they said, even if he, God decides not to, not to save us, you know, we're still going to worship him. And my thing is that even if you don't actually get through the storm, mm -hmm. you can still rejoice because ultimately, 
we will be leaving this earth and ultimately we will be rejoicing and living with God in heaven. But the idea yeah. is that he's going to Oh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yes, and that, and that is important. One day I put, yeah. I put on my safety shoes and went out to work. And, and then I realized I got a stone or some pebble caught in my shoes. And every time I walk around, it was an irritation and so on. But it didn't stop me from getting to my destination, that irritation there. It is not what determined what I will be doing all the time. It is not our adversities that should be determining what our destiny will be. It is our relationship with God that determines our destiny. And because of that, I can rejoice always. So we can say like Paul, in whatever state we find ourselves, to be content. But it's important for us to realize that we are not just rejoicing, but we are rejoicing in, in the Lord. And when we have the Lord, we can smile at the storm. So we need an attitude of gratitude. Amen. Too many times, we, as we studied in the past, this restlessness is contagious. They meet somebody and it's only negative and backbiting. And, no, 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 no. Instead, let us praise him because he's worthy to be praised. He's the all-powerful, all-knowing God. So let us end. I want a point from each one of you to help comfort and give our audience, our members, some hope, rest in Christ. I just found this lesson so encouraging, so uplifting, mm -hmm. because it tells me that at the end of the day, God's got my back. Amen. It tells me at the end of the day, God has my future. He has my, he had my past, my present, and my future. And whatever happens, as long as I hold on to him, because he will never leave me nor forsake me. He will never let go of me. He will always be there for me, no matter what storm I'm going through, etc. He will always be there. All I need to do is just hold on to him. All I need to do is trust. All I need to do is rejoice. And so my encouragement to, us, to all of us is rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Amen. Um, I do not worry about the future. I think Christ has done enough to give me the assurance of the future. I have got this hope that my future is okay. So I do not worry about my future. It is about my now that I'm concerned about. And in my now, as I encountered difficulties day in, day out, uh, as I um, encounter adversity, it is the presence of Jesus mm -hmm. in my life mm -hmm. that makes these adversities bearable. That's right. So I worry about today more than I worry about the future because God holds that future for me. And if it's in God's hands, I am comfortable with that. Amen. It is my present that, I'm, that I worry about and I I know that if I continue to hold on to God, he will make my burdens lighter. And it's comforting, thank you, it's comforting to know that when get, things get tough, God gets closer. Amen. Very comforting. So all quarter we've been looking at this restlessness. They've been telling you about Jesus Christ. Accept him, accept him. What will your response be? For those of you who have not accepted Jesus Christ, and perhaps you're going through turmoil, it seems as though everything is upside down. He's saying, come, come unto me, and I will give you rest. Will you accept him today? Let's pray, Elder Peters, please. Father, we want to thank you for all your assurances so that if we lean upon your everlasting arm, our future is bright. We thank you for that great assurance. Now we have received that assurance, O oh Father. We pray that you will give us the motivation to share that assurance with others. There are others in the world who are dying without hope, and you have appointed us to, to bring hope to the hopeless. So we pray, O oh Father, that you will motivate us to go out and do the work that you have called us to do so that not only us will share in your glory, but others also. We thank you so much for your goodness and mercies to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much for your participation. And those of you who perhaps wondering what book we studied, just go Google and you will find present truth in Deuteronomy, which will be our quarter's theme. Thank you.